are going to build a lot on some of the presentations that you've seen yesterday and that you've seen earlier today. And these three papers are very interesting because they, they both complement each other and in some ways that we will get into after, they contradict each other slightly on what is it that newsrooms can use from a computational perspective to drive audience to individual stories or individual pages and in some cases to getting news bots both adopted within the newsroom and by audiences themselves. So we're going to start with news bots and so I'm going to ask how many of you have interacted with, installed and liked, crucially, a messenger bot, news bot, Facebook bot experience? All right, so it's that kind of conference. How many of you have had, <laughs> how many of you have a, what you would consider to be an ongoing, engaged rate of participation with said news bots after you have installed it and did not build it yourself? All right. <laughs> so one of the things I liked about this presentation is that it gets at those fundamental challenges. And so I'm going to introduce our first speaker. You can go up now. <laughs> this is... Ready? This is Al Jory. He's at the Washington Post. He's a data scientist. And he is going to talk to you a little bit about the WAPO experience of building their first news bots and why it's been useful to them to have a narrower focus, even though the newsroom sometimes wants you to be super general in your approach. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm here to talk to you today about domain-specific news bots, as Stacy said. So Jeff Atwood, the co-founder of Stack Overflow, describes in a blog post what he calls the Magpie developer always chasing after the latest shiny new technology. Much like the Magpie developer, we have the Magpie newsroom, chasing after things that are shiny and new. This can be a good thing. It's how we get ahead of the curve, express our curiosity, and learn about new tools for storytelling. If you look at the media coverage of automated journalism, we have robot journalists next in line for the Pulitzer, soon to write 90% of online news content, the, or the end of human reporters as we know it. This is definitely not the case. Thinking seriously about the subject means looking past these headlines to the real substance. From Siri, Cortana, Alexa, to whatever Google will inevitably name their voice assistant, bots and natural language interfaces are here to stay. We should be actively thinking about our place in that world, thinking about where editorial decisions lie and how much give and take we'll have with the makers of these platforms. How can each platform best serve as a medium to tell stories and what kinds of stories are best suited for each platform? Essentially, how will journalism define its place in the world of bots and natural language interfaces? Jeff Atwood says, the Magpie developer sometimes loves change to the, to the detriment of his own craft. Like the Magpie developer, the Magpie newsroom can get distracted by the newness and shininess of the technology to the detriment of its readers or users. At some point, once we're done experimenting with the technology, we should get over its newness and shininess and think of the technology as a medium for storytelling and start thinking about what kinds of stories can benefit from this medium, new medium and how. Two great examples of such bots are the Homicide Report and QuakeBot from the LA Times. The Homicide Report follows police blotters to write an article every time a murder is reported. The QuakeBot monitors seismic activity to report as or before an earthquake occurs, often being one of the first articles to do so. Both of these bots are specific to a single domain and provide an invaluable service to its readers. In our experience, we found news bots are useful when communicating large amounts of information, often changing over time. The user should be able to get relevant small piece of information out of a large database about a particular beat or topic area when and where they need it. At the Post, we've worked on two bots thus far, an internal primary election spot and our first public debut with the Olympic spot. We're also working on a generalizable bot building framework for automated reporting, which we call Heliograph. For the primaries, our bot reported on a number of different events throughout the race, such as polls closing, the first returns come in, a race gets called, exit polls released, etc. We worked on creating a system that gave real-time updates on a number of different platforms for both one-way and two-way communication. Depending on the medium, we changed the output we produced. For example, on Twitter, we, for example, on Twitter, as various events occurred throughout the race, we simply tweeted them out. On the other hand, on WordPress, we created a single living story and updated its contents over time. Similarly, on Alexa, we use what we essentially, the lead of our living story to tell a story, to tell what's going on in a race at the moment that a person asks them. 
So given the highly, number, highly varying number of primaries on a day, a significant challenge for stream-based one-way communication channels, Twitter, was to keep the user informed when there's only one primary, and at the same time not be overbearing on days like Super Tuesday. Learning from the primaries, our Olympic spot was a bit more limited in scope. We provided real-time medal results, schedules, and medal tallies to users on a number of different platforms. Notably different from the primaries was our use of the live blog in the Olympics. Instead of reporting on a single event changing over time like an election, we only have data on when an individual or team wins a particular medal. Because of this, we injected short, bot-written posts into our live blog every time a medal was awarded. We found this to be an excellent collaboration of man and machine, allowing the bot to do what it's good at, regurgitating data in a readable format, and the journalist can provide context around that medal or focus on events that are more interesting to our readers. This was far better than having journalists play whack-a-mole trying to cover every medal result the second it occurs. And now I present to you Heliograph. Heliograph is our framework for natural language generation and automated journalism. It allows, create, it allows the creation of new, new domain-specific bots that extend to multiple one- or two-way communication platforms. Now, unfortunately, there's no one button I could just pop, press and that a bot pops out. Building domain-specific bots takes a significant amount of time and energy. What makes them good is often the fact that they're so different from one another. This also means it's very hard to reuse code. Heliograph is our attempt at finding those pieces that can be generalizable and helps us create new bots without starting from scratch. I'm not going to walk you through the different steps of Heliograph. So the first component of Heliograph is the observer. The observer is constantly monitoring our various data sources and looking for changes in data. The observer is essentially taking data provided at a particular point in time and converting that data into a stream of changes. The, this is the key to creating our data-driven system. This is necessary because most data sources out in the wild are provided as rest endpoints. For data providers here looking to ride the bot wave, starting to provide webhooks would be a great first step. Not all changes to data are meaningful. The detector defines the concept of a trigger and an event. A trigger is based on the previous and current state of a particular entity. In the case of the primaries, this can be precinct reporting has gone from zero to anything greater than zero. The corresponding event would be that the first result, first returns are in. Looking at just the pieces of data that have changed, the detector checks for each of these triggers. For the primary election, these events could be the votes have started to come in, a race, is, uh, a race becomes close in terms of the characterization of the race, the precincts reporting increases by, let's say, 10%, a race has been called, 100% of precincts are reporting, et cetera, et cetera. The reason we define so many events is that if we only have one primary on a particular day, we need a way to keep a user engaged and informed, and this means finding events within the data. In the case of the Olympics, this was much simpler. There was only one event, a medal being awarded. The writer is one of the most interesting components of Heliograph. How do we take this data and convert it into a story? We do it through a process known as natural language generation, or NLG. So while there are many different types of NLG, it's generally a three-step process. There's document planning, micro-planning, and surface realization. Document planning involves deciding which information will appear in the output text and how chunks of information should be grouped in a document. For example, if we're writing a story about an election, we can start off with a lead that represents the current status of the race and then move on to another graph about the balance of power. Micro-planning is deciding which expressions should be used to refer to entities. For example, in the Olympics, if we're talking about pole vault, we'll say, with a jump of five and a half meters. Here we define with a jump of as the verbiage for this particular event. Last but not least, surface realization is where we take data and decisions from the planning stages and finally create text. One way to perform this surface realization is through templates. So templates are simple Mad Lib style blobs of text and can be combined with data to create a story. While templates definitely have their place, we found them to be a pain to work with when creating more complicated or nuanced stories. As an example, in the primaries, for both our living stories and for Alexa, we want to generate a sentence that summarizes what's going on in a particular state. While 140 character tweets are easy enough, writing templates that talk about two things in context of each other, in this case the Republican and Democratic races in a state, tends to get rather complicated. We quickly found that no assumptions can be made in the realm of elections. You can't assume that each, race has two, each state has two races. You can't assume that they'll both be primaries or caucuses. You can't assume that they'll be on the same day. And you can't assume that the polls will close at the same time. It's pretty awful. <laughs> the first approach to creating the summary sentence may be, let's just combine the two independent clauses together. 
we can pretty easily make a sentence describing what's going on on the Democratic side and what's going on on the Republican side, and we can sort of just mash those together. There's two issues with this. The first is that you create a sentence that doesn't sound very human-like. You have a redundant information in the second independent clause, such as the name of the state. The second is that combining independent clauses, which are stored as text, is really hard. So you're removing the last period, replacing it with a conjunction, ensuring you have the right space in, uncapitalizing the, sec the beginning of the second sentence. You'll definitely mess up punctuation somewhere and spend a day hunting down a comma or an extra space that appeared out of nowhere. An alternative to templates is using a library named Simple NLG, which allows one to define a sentence using its syntactic structure. These small components can be easily changed, added, or removed. Simple NLG serves as a surface realization engine that uses the rules of the English grammar to convert a sentence's syntactic structure into a full-blown sentence, complete with capitalization, punctuation, subject-verb agreement, and more. Another benefit to using Simple NLG is the ability to define a single general syntactic structure for a sentence and modify it slightly depending on the context. For example, in the Olympics, we would change the noun of the first prepositional phrase depending on the event without necessarily having to duplicate a template that's almost essentially the same. So in this case, that would be changing with a time of to with a jump of. We can also change the tense of a story on the fly because some mediums such as Twitter are generally present tense and other mediums such as WordPress may read better in past. The last component of Heliograph is the distributor. Distribution to one-way channels is quite straightforward. The distributor acts as a wrapper around various APIs such as Twitter, Slack, WordPress, etc. In more high-frequency applications, it can form a queue to prevent rate limiting as well. It's a bit more complicated for two-way communication. Above, you can see an example of our face mes Facebook Messenger and Alexa bot in action. For these two-way channels, the distributor acts as an API. Two-way communication can be more complicated because each channel may have different features that it supports. Two main features where Alexa and Messenger differ are sessions and methods of querying. So for sessions, Facebook Messenger has no support built in into the platform for sessions. Each request from Facebook Messenger to your API is completely stateless. For example, if I ask a user to type in the name of a country, the next time someone type, talks to the Messenger bot, I have no idea that the user is responding to my last question. Each time the user talks to the bot, we have to process it independently of everything else the user has said, so there's no easy way to make the experience more conversational. The only way to do this at the moment is to manually store state in the bot by tracking the user ID and what the user has said in the past. Alexa, on the other hand, has extensive support for sessions and encourages using them extensively. For querying, Alexa requires you to essential, essentially model human behavior and predict every possible way a person can query for something. If the user says any sentence structure that we haven't accounted for, we simply will not be able to respond to the user. This can be as small as a deviation of an article to the query. Messenger, on the other hand, may be able to use simple entity extraction algorithms to tell if a query has, has, uh, has Usain Bolt in there and still respond appropriately. It does not require one to map out every single possible way that a person can query for some information. In Alexa, this is referred to as utterances. Each platform has technical limitations. The platform you choose to build for affects that kind of the kind of information you're getting across to a user. For example, we chose not to support querying by athlete names because we started with a voice interface, where names can be really hard to handle. In a text interface like Facebook Messenger, it may not be as difficult. If we started developing with Messenger, we may have included this functionality. This is an editorial decision masquerading as a technical decision. Last, there must be a balance between building for multiple platforms versus making a great experience on one. Heliograph's infrastructure is the result of the ongoing maturation of conversational bot technology in our newsroom. We found that domain-specific bots provide value to readers and newsrooms by allowing newsrooms to cover vast amounts of information that may otherwise not get coverage by delivering relevant, timely, and personalized news to the reader. As automated journalism matures, we expect that many more news, new, newsrooms will go from their first experimental bots to making automated journalism a regular part of their storytelling tool belt. In the future, we expect to see other architectural styles and bot generation tools. We intend to continue to improve the Heliograph platform and plan to utilize it to make bots that cover news in various knowledge domains. Thank you. Thank you. So after we've had all three presentations, we're going to get a little bit more into some of the implementation challenges that these papers describe. But I would like to read you one line from 
Al's paper because it made me laugh out loud. It said, starting the conversation with the newsroom for how to define polling delays and cash invalidation tends to start with instantaneous and we haggle our way up from there. This is something that sounds familiar with you ever having dealt with journalists who are like, so you can do this right now, right? And I can have it in five seconds. So there, there's been a lot, a lot of these, these three papers all discussed like the challenges, I suppose, if you're putting it charitably, of dealing with technological limitations and journalistic expectations. Okay, so now I would like to introduce Shu Guang Wang, who is also a data scientist at the Washington Post, and he is going to talk about Headliner, which is a system that they built to automatically suggest headlines on different news stories. All right, thank you, Stacy. Uh, so my name is Shu Guang. I'm a data scientist at the Washington Post. Uh, today I'm going to talk about um, the Headline Suggestion System at the Washington Post. It's a joint effort of uh, the Washington Post and the Harvard University. So. Um, Professor Raj, who is sitting over there, um, is from the NLP team at Washington, uh, at Howard University. So, um, why we need this uh, highland suggestion system at Washington Post? Right. Let's address this problem uh, step by step. So, first look at um, let's look at how at Washington Post we uh, how we generate highlights. Um, so, um, currently uh, it's done manually. So, basically, um, copy editors or homepage editors, or even sometimes a social team. Uh, we look at articles, and then since that's so awesome and really um, tra well trained, so they spend maybe thirty seconds or a minute. Um, yeah, they get a very good idea what highlights is, um, they're going to create for the articles. So uh, the following question would be: uh, Is one headline is enough uh, for a news story? So we know that people now uh, read news uh, from everywhere, different platforms and different devices or medias. You know. Um, Many cases, uh, newsroom or, or all these editors has to come up with different highlights. Uh, depends on type of platform, depends on the devices. Um, this is not the end of the challenge. Uh, the reality is is even more challenging than that. So um, there's a very successful tool at the Washington Post has been employed at uh, all newsroom teams, uh, which is a variant testing tool called Bandito. So what this tool is capable of doing is given a set of candidate of headlines, for example, for article, you will automatically in real time decide which headline is the best, most suitable for a certain platform or devices or media. So which means um, newsroom has a lot of, um, has to put in a lot more extra effort to create many, many headlines for single news stories. That's our challenge. Um, for this study, we're exploring the possibility uh, whether we can um, generate headlines for news article automatically. So we explored um, three algorithms so far. They are hedge trimmer, multi-sentence compression, and uh, the state-of-art deep learning model, uh, neural machine translation model. We incorporate these algorithms into the um, um, highline suggesting system that actually uh, inject, is being injected into the CMS system at Washington Post so that newsroom is able to uh, uh, consume the uh, result easily. So in the next few slides, we're going through these algorithms one by one to get a better idea uh, what they are and how they work. So first one is the hash trimmer. So it's a simple rule-based um, system and the um, first part, given an article, you first pass the first sentence of the article into your synthetic parse tree. So based on this parse tree, uh, this algorithm is going to uh, iteratively remove less important uh, content in the sentence and generate the resulting uh, highlights. And it's rather simple to implement. So let's go through a um, quick example um, using uh, an article and to illustrate how this algorithm works. So this is a um, recent article about New York and New Jersey bombing happened uh, like a week or two ago. This is the first sentence of the article. Uh, it says, authorities said they apprehended Ahamar Khan Rahami, the 28-year-old wanted in connection with weekend bombing in Manhattan and uh, Seaside Park, New Jersey, after shootout Monday with uh, police office, officers. So given this first sentence of the article, hydrogen algorithm will generate a synthetic pass tree and then iteratively remove all the less important content. So uh, for this example, you will basically select uh, um, the subtree uh, in this particular big, gigantic uh, pass tree uh, in the red box. Then the resulting highlight uh, that generates they apprehended Ahamar Khan Rahami. 
So the second algorithm we explore is the uh, multi-sentence compression algorithm. So different from the high streamer, uh, you rely not only on the first sentence of the article, you actually utilize the full body of the article. You first select a most representative uh, set of sentences, then you generate the resulting highlights based on the most commonly used word in these uh, sentences. Let's look at the same example here. So, uh, so multi-sentence uh, compression algorithm on the same article, you will select, uh, for illustration purpose, uh, we select three most representative sentences there. I'm not going to read all of them. You can yeah, read it quickly, go through them. So uh, given these three sentences, um, you will generate so-called a word graph. So this word graph is basically, uh, in each node of the graph is actually the words in the original sentence, the edges basically encoding the sequence uh, ordering of the words. So there's two special nodes in the uh, graph, which is starting and end. So it's the starting of the sentence, end of the sentence. Given this word graph, um, so the algorithm will select the shortest path from the start to the end in this graph. Then um, once you find the shortest path, you generate the um, highlights as suspect in New York, New Jersey bombing, uh, arrested and put into ambulance. The third algorithm is basically the um, most interesting one, uh, is the state of art uh, deep learning model. Uh, the underlying model actually is a recurrent uh, neural network. Um, different from the other two algorithms, this is a um, trained model, uh, fully trained model. We train this model with 500,000 sentence pairs. You learn the mappings automatically from uh, the first sentence of the article to the actual highline of the article. Uh, it's uh, expensive to train the model. Uh, sometimes it takes days to train a model out of it. But in our evaluation, you basically generate more um, effective uh, highlines in our data. So it's also, uh, to your best of knowledge, is the first attempt uh, to apply deep learning model in computational journalism and deploy at the Washington Post in production. So uh, let's look at the same example here, same article. So this big Japanese network is basically the underlying uh, recurrent uh, neural network. It's a graphical re representation of it. So the red uh, boxes are the input node, yellow boxes are the output node, the blue ones are the uh, hidden layers of it. Uh, as I said earlier on, so this model is fully learned. So uh, after the training phase, all the parameters have been learned in the whole network. So the way we want to predict the new uh, highlights for the new articles, we basically simply inject the uh, first sentence of the article into the model through the input node, and uh, the model will automatically generate the highlights word by word as a sequence. So we have um, talked about uh, the algorithm we've explored so far, and uh, basically now we come to the fun part, we need to find out how well they can perform whether it's possible to generate highlights automatically for news articles. So we use all the articles published by the Washington Post and we um, evaluate uh, all these algorithms in on two set of testing. Uh, one is the kind of uh, um, five, is, these two sets are exclusive uh, to each other. So first one is the 5,000 uh, article randomly selected and the other one is 100 uh, article randomly selected as well. We also rely on some external uh, packages for the high streamer. It relies on a synthetic pass tree so we use Stanford core NLP package to generate a syntactic pass through for it. And also for multi-sentence compression, you have to select a set of representative sentences. We basically select five of them from the article. Then uh, to train the um, deep learning neural machine translation model, uh, we use 500,000 uh, sentence pairs. So given, uh, after we set up the experiment, it's a quick overview of what are the evaluation results are. So the first uh, column basically is the methods, the second one is the uh, result for the uh, automatic evaluation. So um, we used automatic metrics and blue to measure how similar of uh, the difference between the uh, generated highlights versus the actual highlights. Uh, the number are bigger, the better. You can see the number is not that uh, big. But again, um, you know, it's kind of a, a bias because different highlights to the original highlight may not be a bad highlights. That's why we did uh, another manual evaluation on a smaller set, so uh, we go through uh, the 100 articles random selected one manually to uh, go through whether uh, is uh, to judge whether the highline is good or not. So a highline is considered as good, it basically has to contain uh, the correct context as the uh, original highlines, and at the same time it has to be good English. So um, in both evaluations, basically the uh, deep learning model uh, performed the best significantly. So let's go through uh, some uh, examples to kind of give you a, a little bit of uh, favor about how this algorithm has been performing on the data. So the first example is about article uh, of an accident. So the first blue, um, the sentence in the blue uh, 
uh, called, um, role is the first sentence of the article. Um, a two vehicle accident injured four people Wednesday night and forced authorities to shut down Sutland Park, DC police said. So the actual headlines was used is uh, four injured in Sutland Park crash. The hash rumor generated highlights uh, a two vehicle accident injured four people and uh, uh, multi sentence compression aggression generated highlights uh, authorities shut down Sutland Park way and uh, um, uh, New York machine translation model generated highlights uh, accident shut down Sutland Park way. So the second example um, uh, is about the uh, um, Jung Pack uh, not playing the uh, preseason. Um, so this is a different article, and this is also the first sentence of the article. Um, the actual headline was um, back a talkie. Uh, I may pronounce the name right uh, wrong, so sorry about that. Sorry, sorry, uh, back. So uh, back a talkie out for preseason opener, and the high streamer generated uh, headline is Jung Pack uh, will not play in the Washington uh, Redskins preseason opener, and the uh, multi sense compression algorithm returns. To Highline as back not play in the Washington Redskins preseason opener, and the uh, new machine translation algorithm written the highline as John Pack won't play in Redskins uh, preseason opener. So you can see actually you already see the difference. Um, so the third one is uh, the most challenging sentence because it's really really long. Uh, so you can see actually uh, we're stretching the limit of the algorithms. Let's see. I won't read the full sentence. Sorry about that. It's so long. I feel tired. I'm so thirsty. So um, 23 members and associates with what prosecutors have described as drug gang known as the P3 crew, uh, interesting name, uh, were indicted yesterday, should be indicted, right? Yeah, and blah, blah, blah. The actual um, headline we generated was uh, a leaked, hopefully I correct, pronounce it right, a alleged, oh, thank you. Thank you, Stacy. It's great to have you here. <laughs> alleged drug gang uh, indicted. So uh, you can see, uh, I'm, not, I'm not going to read the rest, you can read it by yourself, but basically you can see uh, it's pretty interesting to see the different uh, difference in these different algorithms. I assume you've finished reading? Good. So um, we have seen, um, we have explored several uh, algorithms so far, and um, it's still work in progress, and uh, we need to put, uh, put in, uh, you know, in the process of uh, incorporating everything into the production, and in injecting into CMS for Newsroom to, um, to use. So there's definitely a few things we want to, uh, we're actually working on. So first of all, it's about sentence selection. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, new machine translation, um, uh, new machine translation and also the head streamer, both algorithm relies on only the first sentence of the articles. Um, but uh, we are trying to make it more creative, uh, make it more, make it smarter to choose the most, the best sentence of the um, article to generate the highlights. And also uh, assuming that, I mean, the newsroom are really, really uh, very smart and uh, excellent people at Washington Post. Also, they have very high standard. We don't want to show the crappy highlights automatically generated by our algorithm to them. So we need to have a, a pretty robust scoring uh, before kind of doing the quality control before showing it to the newsroom. You know, uh, we have to be, you know, get up on the bar with them, if not beyond them. So we have to be, uh, uh, be having our own uh, quality control there. So we need to work on that. Also, we haven't really addressed about um, per platform or per device highlights yet. So we're working on that as well. Um, as I mentioned, it's expensive to train the deep learning model, the uh, neural machine translation model. Uh, we, um, we, some we have uh, some ideas about uh, doing a more efficient model updates. So that's the uh, main direction we're going to be um, working on right now. So the great thing about this, uh, our work is, uh, it's open source. I mean, the, yeah, Professor Rush is going to um, be proud of it. So this is the um, neural machine translation package in the GitHub. You guys can try it out. Um, and also, if you want to know more about the variance, uh, variant testing tool at the Washington Post, feel free to uh, go to this uh, web page and read about it. Thank you. Okay, so one of the things that the Washington Post paper had very much in common with the presentation that you're about to see is the emphasis on headlines as continuing to be the primary means through which audiences decide if they're gonna read the thing, watch the thing, spend any of their time on the thing. And this is, in some cases, what you would expect if you're a news editor, but also like slightly counterintuitive in the emphasis on, no, you have to make sure we have really good visuals, the thing has to load really, really fast. And so it continues to be the case that 
the boring old headline has to actually be a very, very good headline. And it continues to be one of the more important elements of what we're trying to do in a newsroom context and also algorithmically. One of the other things that stood out for me is both of these papers said that the first sentence of a news story is typically useless. I mean, they didn't use the word useless, but for their purposes, the first sentence of a news story was insufficient to help them generate a headline that was considered fluent and acceptable. And as you will see here, the first sentence is often not sufficient either to generate the kind of headline that might attract um, a greater degree of virality. So now we're gonna switch to talking a little bit about virality. And it is my pleasure to introduce Akisato Kimura, who is at NTT Communication Science Laboratories, to talk to you about how his software and the software that his team worked on can generate headlines that are optimized for attracting more attention. Thank you. So my name is Akisato Kimura of NTT Communication Science Laboratories. So the topic of the, this presentation is very similar to the previous one. The, however, the, the approach is very different. And uh, I believe that we can provide some different type of the insight for you. So here is a summary of the, this talk. The, we are now exploring the challenge of fully automatically generating the attractive news headline for social media. Uh, to this end, the, we focus on the identifying the uh, key sentences that are useful for generating the uh, viral news headlines. The, we show that the, this problem can be formulated by the uh, supervised sequence learning that utilizes user activity on social media. And uh, we propose a neural network model for this purpose. So as you know, the headlines are the most significant factors influencing our impression on, uh, of news articles. The, here is an the example of the recent news article from the New York Times and the tweet mentioning the, uh, this article. You can see that the right one uh, uh, gained popularity in Twitter much more than the left one. So here we can pose two fundamental questions. The first one is the, what is the difference between the less and more viral headlines? The second one is the, how to generate more viral headlines. So our previous work the in, uh, presented in another conference 2015 uh, has brought a novel solution for the first question. So we have proposed a, a method for identifying the promising headline from a given set of the handcrafted uh, candidate uh, headlines via running to rock, running to rock, rock. Namely, the, the, our method can estimate which candidate headline is more promising. The, we have also revealed the several promising factors that, that might contribute to the increase of their uh, priority. The, for example, direct, uh, the direct use of article titles has a negative impact. The meanwhile, the existing of images and paraphrasing has a positive impact. So our work presented in this talk uh, provides a novel solution for the second question, namely the how to generate uh, more attractive headlines. Our approach is similar to the standard approach of the natural uh, uh, extractive uh, document summarization in the area of the natural language processing. The first, the key sentences are extracted from a given news article. Then the selected key sentences are compressed and rephrased the, to form a uh, headline with a predefined length. In this work, we focus on the first part, namely the key sentence selection. So, as you can see, the key sentence selection can be regarded as a problem of the binary classification. So, where the, each sentence is a sample, and the uh, key sentences are positive ones. 
also that are in contrast to the standard extractive document summarization, that are, we employed user activity on social media that for building grant tools data set. The here is a framework of the, our method that are separated by the training stage and the testing stage. So now we will describe, uh, briefly describe each part. The first step is the data set building. The, we crawl the Japanese the Twitter post that are through the Firefox API for a year. And extracted those contain the link to an article in the Japanese newspaper uh, website. Then we selected the most viral uh, tweet for every article and removed their uh, tweet article pairs with uh, low variety scores. So of those, we annotated uh, 300 tweet article uh, pairs. So next, for every sentence in every article, that we perform a manual annotation the whether or not the sentence is a key sentence. So this figure shows and there are statistics for position of the key sentences in the articles. So this implies that the later part of the articles were often selected as key sentences. So this means that they're, they're just selecting the read paragraphs are not enough for generating their viral headlines. The second step is the sentence modeling. That we build uh, the recurrent neural network model shown here. So this is a variant of the bidirectional uh, LSTM model. So this one is, uh, has been showed to provide the state of the art performance in the, uh, in the area of the speech recognition. So the input urban, uh, of the model uh, it's an article as a sequence of words. The output is the corresponding labels presented in the previous step. The last step in the training stage is a discriminative uh, training that for precise key sentence selection. So we adopt the support vector machine SVM for this purpose and our exploited output of the backward layer as features for classification. So once we complete the training stage, that we can estimate key sentences from a given new article, so by extracting features from a neural network model, and the classifying features with a trained classifier. So this is an experimental result. So this one is the ROC curve. So blue line uh, corresponds to the, our proposed method. Green line is a naive, uh, naive headline, uh, sorry, a naive baseline that select the key sentences randomly from a given uh, article. So as you can see, there, uh, our method greatly outperformed the naive head, uh, baseline. So we also compared the position of the grant truth and estimated key sentences. So this figure indicates that the, our proposed method uh, can extract key sentences not only from the read paragraph, but also the, from the later part of the articles. So concluding this talk, the, uh, we propose a novel method for identifying key sentences that are useful for the generating viral news headlines. The, however, there are, uh, we have much work to do so. The, uh, for example, the most important issue is a qualitative analysis for the algorithm output. So namely that we have to investigate which kind of the key sentences are selected are with our proposed method. So the model refinement is another important issue. Then the, so the sentence compression or paraphrasing, we have to introduce the 
Uh, finally, though, we have to investigate the effects on the news the sources and the news categories. So thank you very much for your kind, kind attention. So among the many things I learned from Akisato's research paper was that one of the biggest newspapers in Japan, the Asahi Shinbun, is very clickbaity. They design their news headlines for social media to conceal the most important information in order to entice readers to access the corresponding news articles. This is long run unsuccessful for those of you who might be tempted to pursue that path. <laughs> But one of the things I did want, I wanted to start, I'm going to ask a couple of questions, and as an aside on questions, because we're now going to open up, I'm sure you all have incredibly interesting opinions, but I am mostly interested in your questions that you have for the panelists. So if you are tempted to make a statement, I invite you to tweet that statement and to hashtag it appropriately and to reserve your actual questions for when you come up to the microphones. But before we open... <laughs> Before we open the floor to questions, one of the things that struck me about all of your papers was this underlying sense that if only journalists would write things differently, it would be so much easier for us to get <laughs> the information that we need to build our things. Now, assuming a universe in which that were in fact possible, and you could convince journalists in a newsroom to make your lives easier, what would be like the single thing that they could do that would make all of what you've talked about more effective? Can journalists write everything as syntactic hashes? That would make my job really, really easy. <laughs> Synta like syntax structures, syntax trees? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's the advantage of seeing the middle, so I never start. That's great. I'm not never the first person to answer the questions. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, I don't feel, because at Washington Post, the culture is more really um, kind of a changing, so, uh, we are starting to do a lot of experiments. We have to, um, basically everything we work with newsroom together, right? So it's not like we create a problem out of India, imagine a new problem. It's basically all from the actual needs. So I, um, personally, I feel like at least all the things we have been working on are being kind of adopted by newsroom pretty well. So, um, yeah, I don't see much issue of a uh, convince uh, newsroom to use our te technology. But I'm not saying that um, we have been doing, it's, I'm not saying that our job is done. I'm not saying that, let's say for example, my uh, our model of a highlight generation uh, has been doing really well. It's not that, right? Uh, you can see the performance is like only about less than 50% accurate. Of course, when you bring this number to the newsroom or anybody is sensible, they will not say, oh, this is highlight, I'm gonna use it, it's not. But um, it's more for, um, we haven't really uh, optimized model in any way. We use them as more like a vanilla version of it. And also imagine um, we have so many different algorithms out there, right? If we're only using one of them, it's not working well. When now we use almost all of them, if we can, as many as possible. By combining all these things, I mean, this in general is not only for highlight generation. Uh, as long as they're open source, we use all these tools together, integrate them together, because they are different, right? Some of them perform well on certain cases, some of them perform well on the other cases. Yeah, as long as you can integrate them well enough, right, um, at the end, the overall system, we show the result together, uh, potentially can get a very good result of it, as long as it's reasonably well, uh, people just adopt it and uh, use it, and the uh, newsroom will be happy about it. Um, yeah, that's kind of the thing. So I'll probably go sidetracked a little bit, but. <laughs> That's the good advantage of being sitting in the middle. I don't have to stop. So. <laughs> um, Akisato, I had a specific question for you, which is, you showed the New York Times, but most of your data set was on Japanese right. news. Have you noticed anything different about the results for non-Japanese language versus Japanese language tests? Or can you not tell me yet? Yeah, there, actually, there have, I have not tried then, the, any other languages, therefore then the, the, we don't have any answers for it. <laughs> that will be paper two. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to open it up to questions. Ah, I see Ryan. Hello. I have a question for uh, Mr. Wang at the Washington Post. Um, just because I noticed one of the headlines that was generated was something like bombing suspect arrested and then put into ambulance. 
it was kind of this weird, like we don't have sympathy for the bombing suspect. Um, can you train the algorithm to sort of pick the point of view that is sort of more appropriate? Like, you know what I mean? Right, so for, um, that's the result I remember is the hash trimmer, right? So hash trimmer and the multi-sense compression algorithm, they are not trained model. So it's basically, uh, hash trimmer is basically rule-based. Um, oh, uh, yeah, so it's a rule-based system and it's, um, it doesn't really take, take into account the semantic that much. Um, so, but if you look at the result from the neural machine translation model, um, it actually, if you look at the result, all of the results, you can see in many cases, the semantic was actually captured better. So that's why in the manual evaluation, uh, uh, they perform better, significantly better than the others as well. So yes, uh, none of the algorithms is able to do perfect um, in all the cases, but um, but it showed, we're exploring, right? We're at the exploring phase. So we haven't really optimized, even for the rule-based model, we can add new rules, right? We can make the rule more fine-grained. We can make the model better, um, but uh, but given this algorithm as really out of box, right, without changing much from the paper itself, I would say it's already interesting enough. It's already something that we can play around. Um, Highline itself can sometimes be subjective, right? Uh, some people don't like this way, but some people like this way, you know? That's why we have this variant testing tool, right? Um, as long as the sentence is reasonably okay, we put it out there, then the audience will decide which one is the best. Not necessarily have to be me or you or anybody, but audience. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, Nick. Hello. Am I, am I next? Or I don't know. Yeah, and then I'm going to go over okay. here. I'm not right. leaving you out. Don't worry. Um, so I'm interested uh, in how new forms of automation impact um, the labor force in the newsroom and how some of these technologies um, uh, might sort of change um, editorial processes. And specifically, uh, I'm curious to hear um, how you think some of these new technologies uh, might impact um, the role of editors in the future and what the role of editor might look like. I know the Associated Press has an automation editor, for instance, now. Is that a, is that a, a role that, um, that you think will uh, become more important in the future? Are other organizations going to need this as well? Or are other editors going to kind of uh, be interacting with this uh, automation in, in other kinds of interesting new ways? So the, just introducing this, the context here, and I think it was Jonathan Stray this morning that you were saying people are concerned that they're going to lose their jobs and algorithms are going to do everything. But in addition to that, there, are, there have been significant workflow changes. And I, I'm especially interested in the perspective of the Washington Post, when you're thinking about optimizing for different platforms, in not just different social media platforms, but things like Amazon Echo. If you can weave in some of that into how that has affected things, it would be very helpful. Sure. So to answer your first question um, regarding like, how this impacts like, the, the workforce, um, as, uh, what we've done so far has always been trying to like, you know, work with the journalists or work with the newsroom as much as possible um, and try to find places like, that automation can do what it's good at, at least in the current state of like, you know, open source technology, um, and allow the journalists to do like, you know, what they're really good at, like providing context and like, you know, adding additional information. Um, so, in terms of like the labor impact for for our Olympics, like I think we were able to save like one person's time, like you know, pretty much every single day from just literally sitting there and just typing in like somebody won like an equestrian race, somebody won like some table tennis race, like you know things like that. Um, and in terms of like uh, elections, like we're looking forward to, to doing more similar things. But like a lot of times, like you'll find people just copying and pasting from mm -hmm. from like an AP Wire story and just like putting it into our own story. Like this is what happened, like you know, the third congressional district in like Massachusetts or something like that. Um, so we're trying to figure out like you know where are those places where we can automate just the the super rote stuff um, first. Uh, I leave the more creative stuff to Shiguang. And are there new forms of labor that we need uh, on top Definitely, of the Definitely, like I've I, I read about like the, the AP uh, automation editor as well. I think it was like Tom Kent or something. Um, and I think that while we don't have a role like that at the moment, um, that might be something we, we'd look into in the future. Like we, 
uh, these days I've been working with like basically the, the editor for each section in order, to, in order to do like both the editing of the human written content and also like you know the bot written content. Um, and it's a very different style of editing. Like you have to not necessarily think about like a single story but you have to think about like multiple stories at the same time. It's difficult to start writing a single story until you have all the edge cases in mind. Like will I have, if, yeah basically. Um, so you sort of need an editor that's like thinking in that way. So. Very interesting, thanks. Can I move to your question? I just had a question about your bot news generations. I believe I have heard that a lot of financial stories, earnings reports, 10Ks, 10Qs, SEC filings, are automatically turned into news stories. I may have that wrong. Does that have a connection with what you're doing? That's absolutely happening, um, and it's it's very prevalent in like the the financial world. Um, it's uh, it has a connection to what we're doing in the sense that we're we're doing something similar, and that we're trying to take data and turn it into text. Um, what what they're doing in the financial world, or like what other companies like Narrative Science is doing, is like you know far more complicated than what we're working on right now. <laughs> you can talk to Professor Birnbaum about that. Hey. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so when it comes to generating one headline, or maybe two headlines, one for print, one for web, I, I think that you know, journalists can do it. But if you think about all the different demographics out there, and if you think about personalization and the level of familiarity a user might have, so it's also possible one could contemplate generating a custom headline. I would like and, a question, please. Sorry, my, my question is, how would you rework your, whatever you implemented, to work if you have the the, the history of the user and what they have browsed and what they know. Would you do it any differently? All right, that's um, probably not the intention of the project I'm working on, that's a good suggestion. So uh, our intention is more for um, find out in general, right, for the general public, not necessarily for like one particular user. Uh, While well, there will be a lot of work to generate per user highlights. That's, um, I'm not sure why we want to go that way. <laughs> Um, another thing is um, the various testing tool we have is more for deciding the best headlines on uh, per platform or per device for group of users, not necessarily per users. So uh, you can say that as still as a kind of a high level personalization, basically per uh, platform, let's say even there's a difference between Twitter user and Facebook users, right? Um, the way uh, they like, the, maybe they like questions, maybe they like, like top 10, uh, things you need to know, blah, blah, blah. There's a different ways, a different flavors they, they prefer on different platforms. But when you talk about individuals, um, that's not actually the intention for the project I'm working on right now. Yeah, for example, if your user is in a different country, you may assume that they know less about this subject, so you can give them a more different headline. So right, right. Um, yeah, so if you're talking about democratic, uh, yeah, um, yeah, that's, if you're talking about that country overall, yeah, we can do something about it, yes. Okay, so, so I wanted to ask if there is sort of an average viral headline that you have found, or and if there are any like, common characteristics in your analysis of the Twitter Japanese fire hose that you found? Um, that's frustrating ideal for a social team, actually for us. Um, we may have some data, but I haven't really looked at it. So because so far, uh, all this uh, viral testing tool is really automatically done. So once it's set with, so that's the good thing about this uh, whole system, right? We don't have too many human intervention in between, so yes. But we can get the data, yes. But I haven't really looked at the data saying, these are the viral uh, articles on this platform, these are the, um, Highlines for viral for that. Uh, we haven't really collected that data. It's stored, but no, I haven't really looked at it yet. Okay. I have no idea. Okay. Maybe you can. Have you found an average viral headline? <laughs> oh, sorry, I cut it. <laughs> have you found an average viral headline? Is there like a magic source, a no, secret source, or a magic formula to virality? Probably not. Probably not. I, can t I, can t I can talk about this as a, I used to work at BuzzFeed, and we hate clickbait, right? And so you will notice that BuzzFeed headlines are the most literal things that you can find on the internet. Here are 10 pictures of cats that will make you feel things. Or you know, we will sort of tell you exactly, I think that is an actual headline, I'm not sure I'm making it up. Um, or here are, you know, we're very, very descriptive in our news stories and what we have found sort of anecdotally and what our data scientists have helped us to confirm is that Counterintuitively, the more information you give somebody who is time sensitive and has like 
high switching costs or low switching costs, the more likely it is that that person will go on to read that story rather than forcing them to do work to decide if this is something that they might be interested in. Um, just two points. Uh, one is to just clarify. May I correct to understand that you've not used your headline tool to actually generate headlines that went out so far? Yeah. I just want to confirm. Yeah, it's my question, right? So, okay. Uh, yeah, two highlights. <laughs> this one is fine, yes. <laughs> Why you mentioned about highlight, it's me, or, yeah. Okay, anyway, uh, to back to your question, so are uh, you asking whether we're using original highlight as the input of the model to generate new highlights? No, we use the uh, first sentence mainly for uh, high streamer and also the uh, neural machine translation model. Then for the uh, multi-sentence compression, we select uh, sentences from the body of the article. But have any of those headlines gone out to public Washington Post audiences, oh, yeah. or are they only you, internal? So this is basically where you had the exploration phase. We're not showing it on the pub, in the public yet. So um, we will have a uh, human in the loop at the end of the loop, which is a home, ed a home page editor, or copy editor, or a social team. They will have the final guide to say, OK, if this um, highlight is good or not before we're really using it. The other thing was, um, like, uh, for a lot of stories, you know, there are rules for headlines, but you, the way you'd frame it and what works and what doesn't. But there are other instances when, like, when something newsy happens, those rules go out the window and anything that's related to that event gets a lot of hits. Does your sort of uh, headline algorithm look at that as well? Like, you know, it, it, if today there was a terror attack, then anything related to that would just be super interesting. Um, is there a way to factor that in? So, um as I, uh, so basically all these models work on the articles. If you don't have articles, um, you will not be able to generate highlights. Yes, if there's an article about the terror attack, yes, it will be automatically taken into account anyway, right? If there's no article about it, um, if nobody has written the article, there's no point that we can generate the highlights on top of nothing. So remember, uh, we still need the newsroom to really, really create the content. I'm not talking about the fact wisely, not like the, uh, Olympic, we have like uh, scores, we have who won the gold medal, that's a fact. But we need a newsroom to actually create first the content for the news events, right? So we cannot, uh, machine cannot create from, at least not at this stage, to create something from nothing. I think it was Meredith Broussard this morning who was saying that a lot of the context that informs a news story lives in a journalist's head. and. We're, we're still at a similar stage computationally where these things are working independently and aren't able to kind of interact with context that's not explicit or not incorporated into that model. So we have time for exactly one more question. So it's going to be you. Make it a question. Great. So to that point, um, do you think it's problematic to be writing your headlines off the body of a story that's already been written? Because then presumably the person who wrote it didn't know exactly how their story was going to be pitched to the, to the wider world? So is your anyway. question that somebody not writing their own headline or having it algorithmically written is somehow problematic? That uh, if you're writing a story to get the widest audience to get most consumed, why is it only the headline that uh, should be considered by the algorithm and not? It, like, I think this is a question that you could have posed to newspaper sub-editors about 50 years ago. Um, in what, you know, For a very long time in media, the person writing the story was not responsible for writing the headline. So in that sense, this isn't that different. Is there something specific to what they're doing that worries you more than that? No, just if you're, if you're relying on, on attracting audience to your story um, for, the, for the headline, or only through the headline, why wouldn't you, like how, if, if the arrangement was flipped, if you wrote your headline first, how could you do it without the story? You know, it, there are organizations right now that write their headline first, and these methods don't, uh, can't deal with that. So is that problematic? That you're entrenching this idea that the headline comes second. I think we'd be incorporating like headlines like these with a tool like Bandito, so we'd be able to have like you know your original headline and your multiple headlines, and like we would essentially figure out which one would be the best. If that answers your question. Okay. So you are saying uh, you are saying basically if there's no article, you want to come up with headline first, right? Then, without assuming that the article is already there, is that what you're saying? I'm saying the information exists, the article doesn't exist yet. But. Yeah, so basically at the Washington Post, uh, it's kind of two separate process, right? So uh, content creation versus uh, the highline creation. Highline creation is actually done by copy editors, homepage editors, and a social team. 
So it's not necessarily the journalist creating the highlights. But um, for the algorithm wise, uh, yes, it will be, you have to have some content first in order to generate something out of it. So as I said just now, uh, these algorithms are not meant for creating something from nowhere. So you have to have some to base on. Um, if you don't have article ready, you just want to come up with headline, then that would be the p different problem. It's not really a headline generation, it's more like find out the news lead, right, from Indeed. all these happenings, right? So I'm not sure whether I address a question okay. or not, but. Well, that's yeah. it, that's our time. Thank you very much.